really pleased to be able to welcome uh, tonight for our first talk on the Dark Universe. Uh, Professor Sarah Tuttle of the University of Washington will tell us about Dark Energy, <laughs> Dark Matter, uh, and Honors, the universe and the heart. So please welcome Professor Sarah Tuttle. <laughs> Are you ready? 
Now, not counting the stars that are in galaxies, because there's billions of stars in every galaxy, how many foreground stars, so stars that are in our galaxy, can you see in this fantastic image? How many? Oh, we've got hands up. Got, I've got some zero guesses. What else? Two. Any other numbers? Zero. Good. Beer number. That's not a four. Good. There are two. Two. All the rest of these points are galaxies. All of them. Isn't that ridiculous? This is the size on the sky of a dime held out at your arm's length. You know, assuming you have like standard arms and not unusually T Rex arms. <laughs> so, you know, there's some error there, but Paul working it. Okay. So, for a second, we're going to delve into the otter portion of the budget. Since I have exposed the lack of otters so early on in this talk, but hopefully you've had enough beer that you're going to sit for a little longer. So here, oh, you can't even see that. That's tragic. Okay, good. Well, you'll never know what you're missing. Because they're missing baryons. I'm sorry. So, it turns out most of the baryons and the standard stuff in the universe isn't the stuff we're used to at all. Even in that little 5% otter sliver, it's mostly diffuse, warm, or hot gas. This is gas which is so warm and so far apart from other stuff, it can't collapse to form things we're used to, like stars and galaxies. So that's most of it. There's a little bit of cold gas, it's like leaky refrigerator over here, and this is galaxies and stars and otters. And then there's the missing baryons. Okay, so we're like 10 slides in. <laughs> And basically what I'm telling you is we, we don't have any idea what we're doing. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, but of course that's not really true. We, you know, we know some things. And it keeps us busy if we don't know things, and that's cheaper than jail. So when we say missing baryons, what we really mean is we're getting better at measuring them all the time. That's the optimistic way to look at it. And what you can imagine is that since we're used to finding things that are bright and perhaps nearby, as in clumps, looking for stuff that's diffuse and often faint and far away is much, much more difficult. Okay? So this is really, just imagine this pie is slowly getting more filled in as we get our shit together and build better telescopes. Okay? So have faith with us. We're working on it. Yeah. Okay. It's time to play a game. Everyone who's one drink in should be ready to run around. So can I have like two volunteers? I need runners. Who's going to come up here? The best part about this quiz is that many of these are overlapping answers, but you don't know what the answers are, but you might get them right. So I need people to run prizes. So can I have two volunteers up here? Yes, man in the white shirt in the way back. Yes, representing the standing room seats. Come on down. Let's give her a hand. physics knowledge? Uh, one. Perfect. <laughs> good. I feel good about this. Hello, who are you? I'm Danielle. Danielle, nice to meet you. One to a thousand. Astrophysics knowledge? Uh, negative. Oh. Excellent. I like that we're really exploring our space here. Okay. Here's how this is going to work. What? I have so many. These are some of my students. They know. So, here's how this is going to work. I'm going to give you guys, people are going to shout out answers. You want to know if they're right or wrong? That's okay. <laughs> Be generous. Be generous and share. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I would yeah, It's more fun if you run around. But wait till they answer the questions. Make them work for it. <laughs> All right. Are you guys ready? I thought so. Good. So we are going to play a quiz, Dark Matter or Dark Energy. Are you ready? Are you ready? you got to be psyched. Okay. Da -da 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 what is this? Dark Matter or Dark Energy? Shout it out. Otherwise, you won't get it out. Otherwise, 
realize this is just cheating. Okay, good. This is the bullet cluster. It is one of our favorite demonstrations of dark matter. What you can't entirely see from this, I know, are you no sad you got it wrong? I'm so sorry. Yeah, you can't fix it now. Can you see the two colors here? Can you see the purpley color and the pinky color? Yeah, good, okay, stick with me. So this false color is demonstrating the hot gas and the concentration of matter from the bullet cluster. The bullet cluster is actually two clusters that are passing through each other, and what we find is that more standard matter, like gas and stars, is kind of electromagnetically sticky. So it kind of sticks together when the clusters crash together, and the dark matter is like, see ya, sucker. <laughs> which you can see demonstrated in this slightly blurry and not very bright video, but look. Dun, 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 dun. I know, look. And so there you have gas, and then here is the dark matter. Ooh. That's the only appropriate response. Now, this is useful because we're observing dark matter, but a tricky thing is that we don't actually know what dark matter is made of. I'm telling you, there's so many questions. Okay, dark matter or dark energy? You have to yell out loud or they won't know to get your for dark matter. This is a lovely demonstration from Symmetry Magazine that I enjoy a lot. So we know a lot about particle physics, particle astrophysics, but there's still many suggested particles and we're in the process of measuring them and trying to figure out what it could actually be that is dark matter, how it's interacting with everything around it, because it is the dominant form of matter in our universe. Okay? You ready? It's probably not an honor, by the way. Okay. Now we're getting to the serious portion. You can tell because there's a plot. There may be as many as two more plots in this talk, so stay strong. I know, I know, you're gonna make it. I have faith. So, one of the tricky things about dark energy is trying to convince you that we are not total lunatics for telling you that dark energy is a thing, even though we don't know what it is, nor that we can measure it. Which, you know, might test even the most enthusiastic of you. So, what I'd like to demonstrate is that through a variety of observations that are extremely different, they might cover different distant ranges, they'll cover 
all different sorts of astrophysical properties, we are able to pin down that dark energy exists, that the universe is expanding and accelerating, and we're not yet quite sure how to explain that. So this plot just shows us constraining some cosmological parameters with three different experiments. The cosmic microwave background, there was a question on that, did you get it right? Type 1A supernova, that one too. And the baryon acoustic oscillation. No one asked about that because it's hard and confusing. Okay, but what you'll notice, what you'll notice here is that those overlap actually in an extremely narrow part of this plot. So that should be telling you something. And it's not just that people are good at drawing. So first, we're going to talk about the cosmic microwave background. So how many people here have observed the cosmic microwave background? Yes. Great. So if if you are either old and so have owned a tube television, or you're such a committed hipster that you own a tube television, <laughs> when you turn on your television in between channels, you get snow. And about 1% of that snow is the cosmic microwave background. It is the leftover radiation from near the beginning of the Big Bang. So there you go. Next time someone gives you grief, just be like, I'm an observational astrophysicist. <laughs> It seems like I'm just surfing channels, but it's an experiment. <laughs> so the cosmic microwave background is exciting for a bunch of reasons. One reason is this really fantastic cartoon that hopefully everyone here has experienced. But the plot that spawned it is amazing because, see how there's this really nice curve? There's dots on that curve. The error bars on those dots, which are observations, are so small, they're basically the size of the line, which is the theory. So like, for one time, our measurement and our theory line up smack on. Shocker, people won a Nobel Prize. Woo, I love it. It's fun sassiness. Science, it works, bitches. You know, sometimes. <laughs> So the cosmic microwave background is seen here. So we've sent up a bunch, many satellites to measure and map the cosmic microwave background. Here we have slices from COBE, which went up in the 90s. That really gave us this initial confirmation. WMAP in 2003 and Planck in 2013. What you can see here is we're getting better sensitivity and more spatial resolution. The fact that the colors are different over here is just because Europeans don't follow direction as well. <laughs> The cosmic microwave background is interesting because it lets us know that the universe, in fact, is expanding. Which, if you think about it for just a second, is kind of weird. It's weird that the universe is expanding. I think it's weird. Even with the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe is surprising. It's also a good place for my favorite observational astronomy story. So there was a brave and intrepid theorist who thought up the cosmic microwave background. He was like, we're going to find it. They start building an experiment. We're going to find it. Down the street, there are some good-for-nothing astronomers, and they're trying to do an experiment with a radio telescope. And the radio telescope was hosed, and it wasn't working, which was a bummer. And they tried everything. They went with all the switches, and they turned it on and off, and they plugged everything in, and they looked it, and it didn't work. So finally they went out to the telescope, it was a radio telescope, so it's a big horn, it's a big giant horn, and the horn was filled with pigeons. You guys, pigeons are not good for science. I mean really any science as far as I can tell. So they shot the pigeons, they cleaned up the pigeon poop, and actually the noise was still there. So then they were just really sad about it, they lay on the floor, and then eventually they were at a bar, much like this, chatting, and someone said, oh, it's weird that you measure that, because the guys down the street thinks that's the beginning of the universe. <laughs> and then they won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> totally how it happened. So, I've given you roughly 30 seconds to be okay with the idea that the universe is expanding. And like maybe you can talk yourself into that, right? There's an explosion at the beginning, stuff is moving apart. So, unsurprisingly, people were a little mixed on that. And so they started making other measurements. This is a measurement using supernovae. Type 1A supernovae are interesting because they're standardizable candles. That means we know when they go off, they're sort of like 100 watt light bulbs. We know how much energy is coming from them. 
So if I took some brave soul here and handed you a 100 watt light bulb and said, walk away, you could walk away. And then we could take images and figure out how far away you were by how dim that light bulb was, you know, and how mean we were by how long we let you walk. So you can do this with supernovae, and so of course in the 90s, we've been working on it, but it's hard because if you look here, these are bright supernovae, people did this, huzzah, everything looks fine. These lines that are super faint that you can probably barely see because we're in a tent, uh, these faint lines are predictions to confirm the expansion of the universe. And there were several teams working on it, and what they found was that it wasn't fitting their predictions, which is awkward, especially since the last people won a Nobel Prize for fitting predictions, you know. You don't want to go too far astray. But it turned out, and here you can see, these are galaxies before and after supernovae. But it turned out when these measurements were confirmed that the universe is not just expanding, but is expanding and accelerating. So I think that like you probably need more than beer for this to make sense. Um, the idea that the universe is expanding and accelerating means not only that everything is moving far away from everything else, but that it's doing that faster and faster. So sometimes people talk about dark energy like vacuum energy, like something is pulling from the outside, because it's really difficult to understand what might be causing this kind of acceleration. Now, I know, isn't that the cutest? You can imagine a balloon. The otter doesn't have to imagine a balloon, because they've already got one. <laughs> we use balloons to invoke this idea of centerless expansion, Although balloons have centers and you can draw galaxies on them, but that doesn't really make sense because it's still really weird. What's even weirder when you think about centerless expansion and acceleration is that it's not always the way that the universe has been. So the universe not only is misbehaving, but is changing with time. So we can't make a measurement here and just assume that that's what happened in early times. And in fact, looking at this, so this is the Big Bang. Isn't that clearly illustrated? <laughs> this is time. So initially, the universe behaved like you intuitively might expect. It exploded. There was a bunch of stuff in it. And it was going outward, but it was slowing down a little bit. Because, like, you know, that's how gravity and stuff and things works, right? And then something happened, and it started to accelerate. And that's where we live now. So we call this in the uh, matter-dominated time and energy-dominated time. And something that Ethan is going to talk about the next talk is, what happens next? You guys, we can't even find the otters, so who knows. But Ethan is going to try and give us some guidance about what happens next. That's one of the reasons we study cosmology, because we want to know what might happen next. This is just one more illustration of the difference between matter and energy domination. So here you can see the balloon is losing, and the anvil is winning, and then the balloons are winning. So if you remember nothing else, just remember the balloons are winning. Okay, we're almost there. Who, who has played Guess Who? <laughs> All right, you guys are heroes. Someone has Guess Who in the back. Geniuses. Someone brought an otter, you have Guess Who. Oh my god, I don't even know. I don't know these people, I promise. So, I use Guess Who as my example for how observation and theory work together, okay? Stick with me, it's totally a stretch, but also I could fit in an otter, so it's worth it. So, we know some things about the universe, right? We've made some measurements. We can measure supernovae, we can measure these things, and we've got all these theories that make predictions. And so what we do is go back and forth, and we ask the universe, do you have glasses? Are those glasses red? Do you have long hair? Are you an otter? And so over time, we eliminate things that don't work. We eliminate theories that don't work, and we add in new theories that might match our observations. So in fact, when the Planck results in 2013 came back, there was an entire field of theory that just stopped being good anymore. There was a whole bunch of people that were like, well, that's it for me. I guess I'm going to go think about something else. So it's a brave life, being a theorist. And you have to be able to explain things like this. So for example, initially people thought that the cosmic microwave background would be homogeneous. It would be flat. But what you can see here is that there's actually huge temperature variations. I mean, really not that huge, but physically, this is a pretty big difference from what we're expecting. So if you would like to be a theoretical astrophysicist, Please remember to explain this cold spot. Thanks. Okay. Last but not least, 
hence you think that all we do here is otters. I'm going to talk for three minutes about HEPDEX, an experiment I'm involved with to measure dark energy, just so you know that we are making a really good effort. Really good effort. HEPDEX is the Hobby Eberly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. It's on this 10 meter telescope out in West Texas. There's not a lot, there's a snake museum out there. That's about all else. They tell us that we should be astronomers to go to exciting places, but I've made some poor life choices. <laughs> so this survey, well, this is the focal plane. This is where the image from the telescope is projected. When it is completely filled, every image will take 35,000 spectra through 35,000 fibers. Those of you that have been lucky enough to win the little woolly giggies, can you look through them right now? Do you, oh yeah, you see the rainbow? That's what a spectrum is, but it doesn't fit on your face, it's fine. So these are, these are each fiber bundles with hundreds of fibers, they sit in the telescope, and it's working, much to my excitement after six years. Uh, it's taking now about 8,000 spectra instead of 35,000 spectra, but it's trying, it's making good effort. Detecting lime and alpha emitters, these are faint, but young galaxies that reach just between two to four, and we're using them to try to detect the baryon acoustic oscillations. Now, baryon acoustic oscillations are a standard ruler. Remember we had standard candles, now we have standard rulers. We like to make it sound like we know what's going on because we have so many dark this and missing that. So, the easiest way to think about standard rulers is we're using the clustering of galaxies, a particular kind of galaxy, to measure the distortion of space-time. So here you can see these galaxies and otters are equally distributed. And if you have a very sharp eye, see how they move? Uh -huh. Imagine if you just had like a grid of lights and you threw them over a 3D object, like a bush or your toddler, they would change how far away they are from each other. And I know, well you have to sometimes, <laughs> to make our own fun block. And it would show you the shape of the thing underneath. So we use these galaxies to show us the shape of space-time underneath to expose how dark energy changes with time. Okay. Also, there's a lot of wrenches involved, and sometimes things don't fit together. And the students are very, very brave. And many of them have stayed in astronomy against all odds. In the end, there were about 150 of these built. I know, it was tiring. And then installed on the telescope. There's all the different pieces coming together. And so what I wanted to point out here is that, you know, I can make lots of jokes about dark energy, but these are huge international collaborations, and they only do a small part of the work, right? And so our collaboration was many continents, and we're only doing dark energy from ranges of two to four in a particular way. There are many other experiments ongoing, including EBOS, which is using um, the Sloan Telescope at, at Apache Point and the South Pole Telescope, you see where the otters get to play in the snow, making different measurements. So what's important here is that we use a lot of different techniques to try to figure out what we're doing to expose what dark energy is. All right, so what is dark energy? Well, it turns out it's gonna take more beer and more time before we can answer that question, but I will just leave you with this, the pensive otter. Hopefully the next time I'm back to talk, we can discuss how the universe has changed in, in the following years. All right, we're going to take your questions. Please speak as loudly as you possibly can so Sarah can hear you from here. And if I can ask Sarah, would you please repeat the question when you hear it so that everyone online can hear the question too? Ooh, there's hello people. Are there more than 15 people online? More than 15? Wow, you guys. Hello online.
Good. So with two-part question one, does dark matter interact the same gravitationally as as other matter? And dark energy, can we measure how the, the, the actual rate of acceleration? So the first, second part, we can measure the rate of acceleration. It's a thing people like to fight about a lot. Um, scientists need something to fight about. This is a good one. Um, and dark matter interacts differently gravitationally, which is part of the different particle issue. Okay. All right. Yes, I see a hand. Go. The question is, can I explain how my experiment works in a slower and dumber fashion? I can, sir. <laughs> Wait, I have to even get in the zone. <laughs> Space time yeah, is flat. Dumber! <laughs> space-time is distorted because of because of the initial conditions from the Big Bang and just after so here, here's a thing to think about because everyone needs an extra thing to think about is the universe smooth or bumpy this is not a trick bumpy right it's bumpy we're not smooth no no smoothness here bumpy so the question is, how do you go from something that's smooth at the beginning to something that's bumpy at the end? And the answer is, for some reason, the universe started out bumpy. And so trying to make those measurements over time is part of what we're doing. Yeah. Yes. If dark matter doesn't interact gravitationally with regular matter, why does it stick together in the clusters before they go through each other? Yes. That's a good question. If dark matter, I was hoping you guys had had more to drink. <laughs> if dark matter doesn't interact the same gravitationally, why is it sticking together in the clumps as it crashes through each other? The short answer, and I want to leave some excitement for Ethan, who will also be talking about these things. Yeah, I'm just drinking, so that should be good. Uh, <laughs> it's a smart man who brings a flask. Um, the answer is it interacts with itself, because it's selfish that way, probably. And it does, it interacts differently, but not, not at all. This is one of the running issues with dark matter is, for example, why doesn't it clump the same way that we see baryonic matter clump? Why doesn't it occur in the same places? So this is why theoretical physicists fight. Yes? Okay. So the question was, since we know so little about dark matter, couldn't it be, shouldn't there be lots of kinds of dark matter? Couldn't there be dark matter, people and galaxies and things? Um, I have not had any beer, so that makes the second part of that question harder to answer. There could be certainly different kinds, right? We're discovering new things about the universe, and you know, as, as we improve the way of asking, um, I feel like dark matter people would be a little complicated. I could take the astronomy corner vote here. There, there are some fundamental issues with the way dark matter that we observe it that I feel like would make life tricky. But if it was different, anything is possible. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to vote down dark matter people today. I'm not going to be on the internet holding that down. I don't need that to be my own. One more question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> if space time is expanding and accelerating, is, is time. You mean like everything going slower the longer we sit here? I mean, it feels that way. <laughs> So, what's going on over there? And it's having so much fun. Oh, it's standing. We're everywhere. But it's my class, so it's amazing. It keeps coming out. Um, so, so, the way to think about... I don't know, do you have a good feel for the expansion in time? Yes. Good. I'm going to pass that question to you. Because, because I think that you'll have a better visual than I have on the fly. I mean, like, I think it's on your YouTube for example. <laughs> it's so exciting, you guys. All right, well, thank you so much. I will be around later if you have questions.